<clears throat> All right, so we're recording. We're going to do this conversation thing. We're recording what's on up there. So we won't necessarily hear you. We'll hear me, though. And the reason I want to do this, like I said, I want to be able to have a conversation about things. And so feel free to ask questions, jump in. We're going to go back and forth, me talking, asking questions, and then we're going to stop and have you guys do some work. Analyze this image, do this. Here's a comparison thing. So we want to kind of make it a back and forth dialogue. We're not necessarily, sometimes we'll guys get you guys up and get to the, um, um, up to the board. Okay, so we looking at images. I like uh, images. This image reminds me of what? The beginning of the whole point of this uh, and what you guys mentioned in your um, some of your synthesis there. What, what, what is this of, possibly? Yeah, this is the scientific revolution, okay? Now, this isn't of a particular person, but the idea of that the scientific revolution is the inspirations for so much, right? And we're going to talk about uh, why. Who are some of the important individuals we need to know about? Who's this person that we should first know? Yes, this is Copernicus. And what tells us that this is Copernicus more than anything else? Besides the fact, like, oh, I know Copernicus. I'm his buddy on Facebook. It's what? Yeah, right here, okay? And ultimately what that is, is, is his what? Yeah, so it's how he, how he envisions the universe. And he envisions the universe. And what does he call this thing? Helio, which means what? Sun-centered. Now, regard, now the, this is going to become a big problem. And the problem isn't necessarily the idea that... And, an idea, a new idea in astronomy. It's not about what he proves. It's more about what hap about what somebody what he and which is the idea. But whose idea is the geocentric theory? So it's not even necessarily the details. It's the idea that the church is being told they are wrong, and, they, and that's and that the big fancy word is called fa fallibility. They want to be infallible. That our word is truth. If there is anything that is not true, that creates what's known as the slippery slope. You ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. Like if you go down this road, whoa, wait a second. If the church is wrong with this one thing, wrong with everything. or who knows, I, what can I tell the right or wrong with? And next thing you know, bad idea, slippery slope. So that's the problem with this. How did, does he, does, do you think he understands this fear of questioning the church? Yes, he does. And he doesn't come out and won't really want to say it. He tells his fellow scientists and so forth. And the story goes is that uh, you can see here, he doesn't even publish his work. His work is he doesn't want anything to do with it. And so on his deathbed, his friends go, hey, you're about to die, Copernicus. Oh, sad. But guess what? We got you. We published your book. And so now you're going to die. It'll come out right afterwards. And he's like, oh, thank you. Well, what he's done in this book will last forever. And, and then he dies. And they're like, oh, okay, so Copernicus' idea is he doesn't have to suffer the ramifications of what would happen. But that's different from who? Who's next? Galileo, right? Now, Galileo's idea, now, Galileo's a scientist and astronomer, and he's known for many things, right? He like the one, like, leaning over the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and I drop a heavy ball and a light ball. And, of course, which one hits first? The... Did they hit at the same time? I tried to trick you, yes. They hit at the same time, right? And he comes up, and he looks at the... The chandelier in church, and he sees it swinging. He comes up with the, the pendulum theory. But the biggest thing that sort of shakes everything is this right here, which is the telescope. Does he invent it? No. Yeah, uh, no. But yeah. Not really, though. But yeah, kind of, yeah. So he kind of gives this weird, we give him kind of credit for the telescope. Other people that did it. He was the first one to really sort of, you know, put it together and did what we, what we know with it. So it doesn't really matter about the, the idea of the telescope, but it's what the telescope does. And you can see Galileo, he's looking up here, right? And what is the first thing do you think he first looks up? Well, we all look up and we see this, right? Oh, there's that beautiful moon and it, there's some color in it or whatever, okay? It looks light and looks dark. His telescope, for the first time, allows us to see this. We can see craters and mountains and valleys, and we can see that this is a lot different than what we had originally expected. So we're getting new answers for things. Um, interesting moon discussion. You guys, you guys watch the news a whole bunch, right? Anybody see what happened around New Year's on the moon? You didn't see? All the NASA astronauts, what they were doing, they weren't partying for the New Year. They were doing this. There's these two spacecraft that it was this momentous event. Both have been shot up. Um, a, lo a slow rocket because it costs a lot more to do a fast rocket it's like back in the day. So these rockets ultimately release two spacecraft that are going to be that are connected. And so on New Year's Eve, they actually created this connection, and now they're orbiting the moon, giving us 
more information. Pretty, they're comparing it to very similar to like when we first landed on the moon, that we're getting some really amazing information, some new high-tech equipment up there. But um, again, still answering questions about the moon, which Galileo first looked at, uh, look at. Now, Galileo's issue is, though, he, he looks at Copernicus's idea and says, yes, it all seems to work. And then he starts doing the math. He carries the one, and next thing you know, he's what? Expanded and proven his idea. He proved the idea, but then there comes the problem. He's a pious man. You know what that means? He likes pie. So we had a long discussion in the fifth period about the difference of cake and pie. Cake is not better. No. No. And then the difference between a pie is better. I understand. You're just... You're like adults, you're like the height of adults, but you're still children. When you become an adult, you'll have much more of a pie appreciation. Okay? The only way that I can possibly give you is because you start with cake. Hey, you love your Dora the Explorer confetti cake. I understand that. And then, but you can grow up to an appreciation of cake, which is called the cupcake. Okay? Huh? But you can balance cupcake and pie together, though. It's, it's so much more nuanced. Flavor. Yes. Think about. It. What's that? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Oh, have you had a banana? Seriously, I don't think I can have this conversation if you have not had a banana cream pie. Banana cream pie. Oh. Now that's a problem right there. Cheesecake Factory. The cheesecake itself completely defies any definition. That's true. It is not a cake. Oh, like Why a is it called a cheesecake? But it's a pie, is yeah, it not? Pie. That's, yeah. isn't that terrible? Yeah. Yes. And what happened with cupcakes all of a sudden? Why in the last four years have we, you maybe, you maybe re, don't even remember life before cupcakes being everywhere. Cupcakes were like, uh, there were some cheap things you buy at the grocery store, like, hey, for a little kid's party. And now they're like this, oh, Cupcake Wars and Cupcake like, Challenge and Cupcake, like cupcake Explorers. And, and cupcakes yes. Have you ever had a 19 Yes. Oh, my God. I yes. Anyway, like I'm saying, Bacon? Galileo loved him some pie. Actually, no, he was uh, religious. And so, and, in many, and so he had a internal debate about what to do with his findings. Do I publish them and deal with the Catholic Church? Because the Catholic Church has been known of being, they don't want to be fallible. The idea of being infallible means we don't make mistakes. And the Catholic Church in its past has been known to not really be acceptant of people with ideas that may question us, right? And so excommunication and... And death, there are some, some tools that they have used in their past. Yes. Yes. And so different from, so the church has an idea, he says different. And so he's given two choices. His choice is one, uh, basically, not necessarily shut up, but recant. Which means, like, you need to stand up and say, hey, everybody, you want you to stand up and admit that what you said was not so true. You know, you know blame it on co too much cough syrup or whatever. But... Say that, hey, my idea, sorry, but I don't know what I was thinking. You know what I mean? I was sick or whatever. So, but, and, and if you do that, then guess what? We'll let you live, and you can be uh, under house arrest the rest of your life. Or not. Keep saying what you want to say, and then under, under the fear of death. So he recants what he says. He takes, he takes it back. And I think it was 19, the church apologized, I think in 19, 1989, I think the, the church officially apologized. I don't know about that one. Yeah, so it shows a little bit about the speed in which the Catholic Church deals with reform. Because it's such a large institution that's quite, that's quite old and resistant to change. Other philosophers we should know about this guy. Anybody know who this guy is? Not Isaac Newton. I love the car this car cool little cartoon because it's so much just like the real guy. Oh my gosh. Look at that. It looks just like him. Rene Descartes. Most people know Descartes just because of his one saying, because it's kind of cool. I... I think, therefore I am. Now, Rene Descartes, I forget what he did. Can somebody help me out, please? What did he do, Olivia? Mind versus matter. Mind versus matter, which means what? They're two separate things. Hold on. 
Two separate things. Good. Give me something else about Descartes. Um, he decided to post life as if he never knew anything at all. Mm hmm. Ah, proof, yes. Give me some other words. Monica. Good, and tell me what rationalism is. I like that, which is what? Rationalism. Somebody else. Yeah. Mind and matter, good. So to find ration, and think about this, it goes to science, and it, he is the bridge between the scientific revolution and the next thing that we're talking about in terms of politics, which is the Enlightenment. It says basically all these things, we've got to find the what behind everything, everybody? The reason behind everything. That is why De Descartes is so important, why he's known as the modern-day father of philosophical thought. So that when you go to the next scientist, this guy, right, who's this? And when you have, uh-oh, 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 boop hits his head and falls on the ground, right? What happens? He looks to and tries to find the, the reason for this to happen, okay? The reason why this happens. Now, Newton, by the way, is a super interesting guy because he was odd. I mean, his brain was so different than anybody else. He had virtually no personal life, never, never married, never uh, had any children. His life was math. And, science and physics and all the laws that Newton's laws that a, a plant a body in motion tends to want to stay in motion and so when we were on our way to the moon there's a there's a great clip of uh, you know uh, Houston uh, NASA Central asking how you guys doing up there they're asking the astronauts and they're like we're doing nothing we're fine because Newton's at the wheel because all they need to know is you do the math you do X X plus Y plus Z and force matter pointed this direction. Next thing you know, you're like, hey, we're at the moon, right? Because of all of these ideas. So all of this, by the way, leads us towards that bridge, like I said, what Descartes does. Now, this guy's important. You need to know him, and he's not in your book. And why he's important, his name is Hobbes. And Hobbes is important because, like the distraction that Mr. Spears mentioned, this is where I think that I'm going to end up with my hairline. I think that this is completely gone, so I think the best answer, nobody looked at Hobbes and really asked him, dude, you're balding. They actually asked, what's with the side stuff? So I'm thinking, if I just grow this way down here, people will go, have you seen O.D.? His hair. No one's been talking about the absence of hair. So that's a good point. Then this is just like a, huh? Nobody even notices that he's balding. It's just the wow. Huh? Is this the guy with Calvin and Hobbes was named after? Yes, but who would Calvin be named after? John Calvin. John Calvin, right? Pre the predestined predestination Protestant reformer. And Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes in. And now Hobbes has got an interesting idea because he's some of these early philosophers, and he's going to come up with an idea of this thing called social contract. Was that mentioned in your book? No, no. Alex. Yeah, Alex. Let's have you ever been put on a contract like that's it. You need to start cleaning up your room, son. You are on a contract. You sign this. I will clean up my room. And if I don't, then you won't. Uh, we won't feed you or something. OK. And you sign the contract like that. I better do this or I won't eat or something. Right. That's a contract. Or, hey, you're going to join the NBA. The Lakers just signed you here. You better sign this. Sign this. Fill in the contract. blank. Contract. So what is a contract, everybody? You have to do and a written agreement, an agreement. Now, who do you think this contract is between? Not the Lakers and Ty or Alex and his, and his parents. It's who? The your government and the people. So what's the agreement? This agreement's got to be what? Huh? And what do you want? If we're living in a civilized society, back to those original eight characteristics, we live together. The government's got to give us what? We've got to protect against who? There's two choices. Well, forget foreign enemies. If I'm living here and everything, not worried about foreigners, I've got I to gotta worry about us. I want to protect. I need protection from you and from you and from you. Government needs to provide laws and security for that. But then also, I need protection from them, from the government itself. So this is this interesting concept of, of, of the social contract. 
you have certain rights or whatever, but who are those right? Who are you getting protected from? Here's what Hobbes believes in his book that he writes called Leviathan. Now, when you hear anybody ever heard of that word Leviathan before? It sounds like a what? It uh, sounds like a sea monster, okay? Which, and then ultimately, this is what his monster or what he envisions this guy to be. This is your Leviathan. And in order to understand where you stand on this social contract theory, it's how you view people. We've had this conversation before. How do you think Hobbes viewed people? Hobbes viewed that you need to have what kind of a government? An authoritarian to control, to protect the people in my society because who do they need protection from? Themselves, because people are wicked and cruel. And if you leave them to their own devices, things get bad. And so you need a Leviathan to lay down the law. And when things get bad, even today, you may love our country and, hey, every country's got it, but when things get real bad, the police don't, we don't even need the police. Guess what happens? We're sending in the National Guard, martial law, curfews at 5 o'clock, you're not going to walk the streets or you're going to deal with us. Every government's got a contingency in place when the people act out against themselves. He says, this is what you need. We've got to protect ourselves from, from the masses. So who's going to follow along and like that kind of idea? What kind of people? What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, governments are going to like that? Absolute. Absolute monarchs are going to like this idea. That's what I need to be. Look at the sword. Look at the size of him. He is made up of, of the people. And if you can remember, this was the phrase that um, Louis XIV came up in French. L'état, c'est moi, which is? When he was asked, what's France? Anybody speak French? What is France? And he said, l'état, or the state? Hmm? Dot, dot, dot. What's the state? What's France? L'état, c'est moi. It's me. What is France? I'm France. This is it here. Hey, that's the Leviathan. What is the country? Those are people. It's me. That's how Louis saw himself. And that's even, the, even when we talk about Louis XVI and all these other ones. Yes? What's that? The people need to respect the laws that he puts in place. Okay. Now, in return, then you have this guy. You take one side of the coin, you've got Hobbesian ideas. Now, you flip it up, then it's this guy. So who's that? Hmm? Say it. John Locke. Okay. So if you get Calvin and Hobbes come from then, or anybody fans of Lost, Locke was one of the major characters named after, somewhat after uh, this guy here. Same name, too, John Locke. Um, CSDs, yeah, you're going to get the heavy dose of John Locke. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, when you talk about Western political ideologies, he's, he's it. He is the founder of this. His idea of the contract is that how does he view people? As good? Every people are born what? Not even necessarily good with a blank slate, yeah. Molded by the environment. I guarantee you, in college, either in a dorm room and you're hanging out with a bunch of friends or, a, or probably some philosophy class, someone's going to ask you, why are you the way you are? And there's two choices, nature or nurture. Were you born this way? Or, or to what extent it is. Let's say you got an identical twin, okay? Now, those identical twins are separated at birth, and one moves to Mississippi, and the other one's raised in Rockland, and they never knew each other. And 40 years later, they come back, and they realize, oh, my gosh, look at these guys. They've lived almost ex identical lives. That tells you it's got to be a genetic thing because they're the exact same. But then the other side of the coin is, well, you look at two kids who are raised by the same parents or the same this or the same whatever, and you're like, similar, and, boy, they sure do, you know, based on different experiences. So you have opposite sides of the coin. Is it a yes or no answer? It is it's a debate that will never end, okay? Locke's idea is the idea is that the social contract is that we need to have the people and create a series of laws because individuals have this, rights. We need to protect them from each other, but we also need to protect these rights from who? The government themselves, who can infringe on those rights. So when you look at the United States and our Bill of Rights, comes straight out of 
Locke's idea, and he says that all people are guaranteed some of these rights. Like what? Life, liberty, and property. Now, when you compare, good example, take the European idea of this, where land holding was something very important, and you bring it to the United States, and then when the enlightened philosophers of the United States, like Thomas Jefferson, look at this, and they're not looking to disrupt the social structure at all and who owns land and whatever, so they realize they want to modify this and say that everybody has the right to life that the government can't infringe upon. Liberty. And then the idea of just being able to do what anybody wants to do and live the life that you want to live. So we'll call it this pursuit of happiness. Okay? Locke is a very important individual in terms of Western ideology. Some other individuals is this. Who's this French guy? Baron de something. He comes up with this, Montesquieu. And Montesquieu comes up with, all right, well, let's come up with a government. But here's the thing. Even if you have a, a, a monarch who is just and he's one of those, remember that was at a, uh, what was that term? It was called enlightened something for some of these rulers. Enlightened despotism to be despotic or a despot is to be an absolute ruler so it's this interesting term this you have some of these rulers who are ruling like a despot most important was the russian who was that catherine, catherine the great and you also had like joseph ii and frederick the second but catherine the great and these other ones are absolute rulers but are interested in the ideas and the enlightenment not for change but for modifying their existing system. Now, this guy Montesquieu comes along and says, it's not about this. No, 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 no. It's not about just having a particular ruler. You have to have what? You got to have balance, okay? You have to have checks and balances. And ultimately, coming up with the system that we have today, which looks like this, which is what, everybody? What's that? Executive. What's that? Legislative and judicial, okay? A series, that's what are able to keep each, each position in check. We need to know him, okay? A Voltaire, this isn't Voltaire, but you should know Voltaire. Voltaire, all these other guys are sort of architects in terms of creating something, a system of government creating a social contract. Voltaire is more of just a critic, okay? Of everything, right? You read in uh, Micromega that he criticizes everybody right and he used the alien analogy of be able to say that hey a, a, somebody who doesn't have to watch what they say because i'm not from here so i could poke fun at laugh at this and your, and your church and your government and your philosophy all those kinds of things voltaire is the most popular of all of these different philosophers of the time so much so that he's he has to he has to flee france for his life and he spends most of his life in england Voltaire is known as somebody who is simply just, he is critical using satire and irony and so forth to, poke, to, to be able to, to talk about those injustices. But the last one, this guy, if John Locke was number one, this guy is also number one. How's that possible? He's number one, but not in the political world. Uh-huh. Because he creates an ism. an economicism that you, it, it dominates your life everybody capitalism and his name ladies and gentlemen come on people some say the first name of names of men Adam is his name Smith Adam Smith is the founder of mod the modern economic theory of capitalism. And his basic idea, although, and check out the year he writes his book, everybody. Look at that. He writes his ideas in 1776. A little ironic because America starts its political path then, and it also starts the book that he writes. It's called The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations is written. And it sets in place this idea of capitalism, which basically says that what, how should you set up your cities and your countries and your economies? And he says, basically, don't. You don't set anything up. You don't tell how many of this you should have and how much that should be. You should just leave it alone. 
Laissez what? Laissez faire. Leave it alone. Hands off the economy. Let it go. Let the market, the free market, decide how many butcher shops you have or how much a pair of shoes cost. All these things are decided because that's what happens through how much the supply and demand and all that. Those are some of our philosophers, ladies and gentlemen. And now let's jump forward and see all of these philosophies put into place. America, we're not going to talk about them much anymore, but let's talk about whether we really see this develop in a place called France. Now, this, oh, what kind of chart is this, everybody? Hi. Hi. Mm. Yeah, there's no cake chart. Huh? Ah, nice pie day. Cake. Cake. Now, look at here at the red. Some interesting things to take note of. This is what pushes this into action, put, put, pushes revolution into happening. We know those states, right? First, second, third states, right? So, 98% of the people make up the third estate. That's most virtually all the people. But now the third estate, like we talked about, is not one group of people. There's a huge division, the strata within here. You got your lower class people, but there's a good chunk of who right here? Upper, middle class, city dweller, somewhat wealthy, called the what? The bourgeoisie. They got to know the who the bourgeois. We're going to talk about them, this entire unit, okay? Not necessarily just here. You're going to talk about them with the rise of communism and the industrial revolution. The bourgeoisie. B O U G E O I S E. Is that it? Anyway, close enough. Um, so 98% of the people are here. Now, when you look at it, these people are wealthy and they even own 65% of the land. And you may look at it and go, oh, I thought it would be a lot less. They still have a decent amount of land, which equals wealth. The problem, though, is very disproportionate. One and a half percent. That means they're very wealthy, okay? And so this is a problem. This is a major issue. This is the problem that we have, but if everybody was taxed fairly, then maybe this wouldn't be much of an issue. But this creates it as a call of action. So ultimately, what the third estate feels, people, that they have to do everything. So it looks, this is the physical representation of that pie chart. How does the third estate feel? Taken advantage of, good, what's another word? All of France, they have to carry this. This what? What's a good word, say it? Burden, I like that. They have to carry the burden. The financial responsibility. And y'all get it, right? Who's this? That's the third estate. Who's this? That's the first. Who's this? The second estate. Okay. And they make him very elderly and he's barely able to hold on. Now, let me ask you, why don't they just, why do you think, this is a contemporary piece. This was written back in the day in the late 18th century. Why would this be a powerful image? And who can, t and can how easy is it to interpret this? Yeah. Particularly for who? Why? What can they not do? Huh? There's still a lot of illiteracy. So, Revolution seemed to almost always happen, starting with the French Revolution, going all the way up to the Mexican Revolution, even India with Gandhi. These are all led by educated, wealthy individuals, usually male. They usually want to have revolution. I want to bring about change. Great, but guess who you need to get change moving? I need to get who? What's this? I got to get that, I got to get that boulder of the peasants moving with me. So this sure helps, right? Mm -hmm. Visual imagery. We see there's some before, but the, but the French Revolution is really sort of the beginning of the political cartoon and a real gigantic push for this idea of propaganda, which you should have saw in Jean-Paul Marat, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jacques-Louis David's picture of Marat in the video that you guys watched, right? Mm -hmm. That is an example of propaganda. 
much like so, all these other images. They're not just they're saying what happened. They're telling a point. So this is the burden. What's this? Three people, which probably stand for what, you think? Who's this? Who's this? Who's this? What may help you is what's in his right hand right here. What's that? Uh-huh. Uh-huh, that once we're on him, hold on, let me go back. Does that help you at all? Chains, no longer on. So I'm, he's over, ah, it's a burden. What has he now done in this picture? What have I done? Beginning of revolution, but in here, he's breaking the chains. He has thrown off the the burden of the first and second estate just so happens to land next to a pile of weapons okay sharpened knives and swords sure a good place to help me get out and let's do oh yeah let's give this thing a title people now this is a fancy term, but they're probably saying this okay it's called uh-oh Okay, no. All right, but what is, what's the title we could probably say? How about, let's start with this. What if I give you, whoa, that's a, okay, what if I said this here? The bourgeoisie, the peasants, something bigger. Yeah. The where, the third estate. That's not a bad title. You can come up with other ones. Now, the beware, oh, that's like Halloween word. That's scary, beware. Why? What else, what other clues do you see in the image that can hint that this is something to beware? What's that? Bastille. Okay. And more importantly, uh-oh, hard to tell. What's that? That's called a stick, which is known as a pike. Okay. Yes? Uh-huh. Huh? And what is on top of that pike? Yes. Heads of people who did not. Name of the card, name of the image? Those who did not, but I just came up with that title, but. Huh? At the Bastille? Yes, we'll get to that in a second, though. All right, so here is the Bastille. The story goes is that when all of this is starting to come down, their people are uniting, they're in the streets, the people are moving, they're inspired by the propaganda, and they hear that Louis is sending the army to France to stop them. He's stopping us. He can't stop us. He can't send our own French army, the army of the people, to stop the people. You can't do that. This is it right here, folks. Same thing. Tiananmen Square. Chinese person, and who's stopping the Chinese protester? The Chinese army is. And that's what they're saying. You can't send in our own army. We need to be ready for it. What, what, how do we need to get ready for it? Fight back. Well, the Bastille was a prison, and they had some prisoners, not political prisoners. Like, we need to free those journalists. No. Inside was a bunch of ammunition. We need the ammunition for all the weapons that we're carrying down here and start, be ready for when the battle is going to happen. Now, they break into this thing. They get in there, and most of them give up or whatever, and most people are let, uh, let free. There was some bloodshed, particularly this guy, the leader of the Bastille. Um, and you may not see his head has been removed from his body and put on one of these things. Now, this is a hint of what's to come with the French Revolution. Because they take, like, oh, death of that guy, and then, like, we will honor his, no, cut his head off and march. Hey, uh, 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 let's go to the, the local judge and stick the head in his face. Beware the third estate. All right. This is a glimmer <clears throat> of the violence that will now soon start to rise here during the French Revolution. In, last November, if you remember, I was gone for a couple days, and I told you I was going to Mount Vernon. This is George Washington's house. Now, this is a nighttime tour I took. When I was there, it was even darker. A lot of these lights were turned off, the one, these ones up here. And it was an amazing thing. I tried to take a picture and it didn't come out because it was so dark. 
We got to go up here where the public doesn't normally get to go to. We walk in the, you don't go in through the main door here. You go in through this door. And in there, there was that cute little Martha Washington lady. Oh, she was just precious. You just want to eat her up. And she sat there and talked to us for like 10 minutes, just pretending to be Martha Washington. We're asking these nerdy history questions. And she's like, well, the, you know, the general's coming back anytime from Washington. And oh, it's like, it was really cool. Anyway, we go walking around. We come back in. And here's the original door that George Washington had put on himself. Just inside the door is that, which was, wow, awesome. Not a key to the house. The key to the Bastille. Why does George Washington have the key to the Bastille in his house? The French liked him. Means that France and England were kind of sweet on each other back in the day. Which is ironic because if you think about this, America has a revolution. Overthrowing, they want to overthrow Britain. Who helps pay, fund this whole revolution? The French do. The French, because they hate Britain, they're like, we'll give you some money, overthrow the British. Yay, and they have this enlightened revolution. Fast forward a few years, bloop, bloop, bloop. And now France is going to have a revolution inspired by the American Revolution that's going to end up killing the king who paid for the revolution in the first place that now got back and bit him in the, well, actually the head, yeah. So, yes. So, in, yeah, the relationship between the French and the American colonies were a close one, as seen with that, an awesome piece of... You can watch the recording. It's the key to the Bastille. Oh, it is? George Washington has it, yeah, in his house, right in his front door. Moving on. This. Now, what this is, and we talked about this, this is the hope of what France could be. When we talked about these guys, this is not the head on a pike. This is the idea, right, the hands together. What can we create, everybody? A what? A united new France, where we're all working together. And again, like I love, I feel like a, like a fanboy, but Jacques-Louis David did this. He did Marat. He wasn't able to color it. He wanted to put this in color, and he wasn't able to. He did a couple individuals. Somebody has, and tell me what you think. Do you like it better? Yeah, yeah interesting. Is it because you got used to the other one? What's well, here, it's interesting. You see light. In the other one, there is no light. A little. In this one, instead of light, I, I notice more. What did you guys call it? The winds of what? I see the winds have changed more than here, where it's more of a... You see the space more, yeah. Interesting what color does. Yeah, and like the guy, he doesn't stand out as much. Yeah, these, these characters don't stand out and pop as much. Did not colorize it, no. Yeah, Yeah. But he did intend to, and there's sketching, sketches of his whole thing that he did in which that he has colorized ahead. He's done like this guy, this guy, this guy, and th he did like six heads, six faces. That's all he had done. You know? A lot of people in what's to do. All right. So they say goodbye, Third Estate. Goodbye, these states all together, and we create something new. And what was this called, everybody? The what? National Assembly. National Assembly. And I like this idea of the tennis court oath and the National uh, Assembly because this is an idea of hope of change for something new in the future. Now, where you sat in the National Assembly was interesting. We talked about it last time, right? Right right, and left. So let's, I wanted to be able to have this conversation with you guys is looking at this. I want to have a modern day political talk so you understand this, okay? So in this pendulum swing, if this thing swings way over here to the right, a reaction like Galileo said when he saw a real pendulum and he came up with that theory, when it gets to a certain point, what's usually gonna happen? You're gonna see a swing back. Okay. Now, in less stable countries, these swings can be violent one way or another. We hope in our country that these swings are more like this. Okay. To the right and to the left. Okay. So now let me pull up some people here. And where do you think these guys would go? Mm -hmm. Where would Obama go? He is left. To what degree of how left would you go if you do arrows here? Arrows here. My seniors, did you guys today, what do you have today? Two days ago. Or the other class had it today, though. They are having actually uh, a voter registration in their uh, economics and government classes. They have representatives from the Republicans and Democrats showing up and saying, here's your sales pitch. This is what it is to be us. This is to be us. Fill out a form, and we, have, we, we kids walk out signing up to be registered voters. Uh, with hopefully an understanding, but one of the things that they do take is they take a poll that they just, uh, a survey, that you just ask, answer a bus bunch of questions. Because most of you, does anybody, how many people raise your hand, you really know what I am. I, yourself, I know that I am a this. 
I'm a Republican and Democrat. You don't have to say what are you, but you at least know what you are. Okay, so most of us, and as you should be in youth, you're relatively undecided. You're right, you haven't really spent a long time looking at issues, right? So, but understanding about what they are. So Obama, Democrats, liberal, left. Those kind of go together. On the other side, Bush, right wing, conservative. What's the other word? Republican, okay? Those are on the right-hand side. Now, we talked a little bit about this guy, right? Remember Mr. Spears mentioned he, said he wanted me to hold the horses? But I want you to understand a little bit the idea. Visualize this for a second. Is that, and there's also colors and animals associated with each. This side, from here to here, is red, okay? Okay, and they're the elephant, okay? And then the blue side's over here to here. So now, in this weird, crazy system that we have, Mitt Romney is the leader of the pack in terms of trying to become the next Republican nominee. In order for him to do this, who picks who will be the next Republican? What kinds of people? Republicans do. So all the Republicans need to pick. Now, some Republicans are very extreme in their beliefs, very far to the right, and others are quite moderate. He is, the problem that he is experiencing in trying to get all a consensus of many Republicans liking him is they all think that he's pretty far center, which means that a lot of these folks aren't super happy with him, okay? But you know what he knows, and same on the other side, it's not necessarily him or whatever. He knows that when election time comes around, these people here will never, ever, ever do what? They're never going to vote for anybody over there. And the same on the blue side. All these people over here, these blue, blue, blue folks, they're never, never going to vote for anybody over there. Not even that, for the most part. These numbers are probably more like this. Okay? You got most of the people who are on one side or another, are, they're going to vote what they're going to vote. So you come up with this interesting one. We'll call it green. Okay? move him out of the way so where this pendulum swings like I said smaller swings after the Bush administration there was sort of a backlash against that and people hey let's go hope and change Obama and all of a sudden well there's not, not tons of hope and change maybe we want to swing back a little bit okay you're gonna constantly see this sort of thing which is interesting because now who decides who'll be our next very small sliver and it's every presidential election is the same thing when you hear numbers every election you're like oh hey obama won in a landslide against mccain it was he got like 47 percent he got like 43 people are like oh that was a huge that doesn't that looks like a close game but in the political speak it's not because they know that this this and those we actually even call them states red states and blue states when you look at a map and they're geographically very interesting because most of the red states are where people who will always vote conservatives where in the middle, okay? And where are the blue states? On the coasts, okay? Very strange. And you look at that and you go, wow, the reds got the most states. Uh-uh. They got the most states, but they don't necessarily have the most what? Most people. So a very interesting conversation. So going back to old Mitt Romney over here, Mitt Romney, he's, he's over here during the election, during the Republican primaries, trying to woo all these people, say, I'm Republican, I'm really Republican. And if he does get the nomination, guess where he's going to head? He's going to come over here because who does he want to get? Just like he's going to want to get, they want to shoot for that middle group, which is kind of odd when you think about that. Our, who decides the future of our country? A bunch of people who do what? I don't know who I'm going to vote for. I'll wait and see. That's the, that, those are the deciding people in our country, right? So if you know of any people, and you probably do, who are really on one side and really on the other, guess what? You're not going to convert them. Okay, you are not. You may try, and they may try to convert you, but interesting there. Now, keeping this in mind, let's fast forward. Ba -doo! Take a look at this here. I want you to spend a minute because I've been talking too much. Can you take the same pendulum, left, right, and can you put these events and or people on there? Let me tell you about them. This is a guy by the name of Robespierre also known as the Reign of Terror. This is Louis the 16th. That's Napoleon, notice how he's dressed. This is our tennis court oath. And this is a document called the Declaration of Rights of Man. 
Some of these are pretty out there to the right side, and other ones are pretty radical liberal on the left. Spend a few minutes talking to your friends. I'm going to call a couple of you up to move these things around. Ready, said go. I would move here to here. I'd swap these two out. Really? Yeah. I see it as this was the this was the belief of trying to reconcile the three estates to bring together the first, the second, and the third estate. And this is a document pushing for social change for the rights of all individuals. Yeah, catalyst, I, I agree with you in terms of catalyst, but the catalyst, it could push it this direction, right? As soon as you get here, some, at some time, something, event's got to have to happen. Here has got to, then it starts to swing the next direction. The direction. I think tennis court is... You think so? Really interesting. I think this is more radical. Now, what's interesting, though, is... Somebody in fifth period, you can date hey, when it's your class, you feel free to say whatever you want. So, interesting conversation. Guess what? You can happen. So, I watched this Mythbusters once. You ever see that Mythbusters when they tried to do, the, sorry, when they did that kid swing? Huh? Can you do a kid swing and ultimately do what? Can you go all the way around? Guess what? Can you go all the way around? Can you become so radical or so authoritarian that you meet here? With rockets, they did. You cannot. You cannot move. You cannot flip your swing over, but under human power. Yeah, under human power, you can't flip the swing over. Um, you get all the way to here, and this is a technical term, but this is called crazy. Okay. Uh, we do an interesting thing. You're gonna. T I'll remind you when we come back to this. You're gonna have on one side a guy by the name of Joseph Stalin, and on the other side a guy by the name of Hitler. And they hated each other, couldn't stand each other, okay? And they were both so far out there that he was way on this side of the spectrum and he was on this side of the spectrum. But they went so far that they should have realized, hey, look at you. Oh, I don't know, you're just as crazy as I am, okay? Anyway, or radical or reactionary for that, okay, good? Now, speaking of that, I wanted to talk about, um, uh, we talked about him a little bit, propaganda. And so interesting in this next particular image we see, just like the other one, but this isn't now beware the third estate. This is the third estate is now what? Huh? Yes. Controlling, right? Now it's listen to the third estate. Follow the third estate. We're the piper. And you're, you're the puppet. Huh? You play, now you listen. To, now we're going to play a little tune, and you listen to us. Here's the Bastille being destroyed. Here's Paris. Huh? The Bastille was destroyed, yes, brick by brick. And then he's sitting on a line, sitting on a symbol of power in repose, in ready to, I'm controlling. You really want me to get off the line? I can get off him and let him go if you're interested. Anybody see that New Zealand clip? That little kid from New Zealand? Oh, my gosh. She's at this little lion, little, like this is lion, the zoo or whatever, yeah. And she's like a little three-year-old. She's this close to this lion across this plate glass. The lion's just sitting there, right? And, she's like, and the lion just goes, rah! He just starts freaking out with his gigantic paws. And the kid does this. That's it. Three years old, barely even flinch. They're like, jeez, this lion that close. It almost ripped your face off. Huh? <laughs> anyway, um, revolution. Now, the process of the revolution, as the pendulum starts to swing, hey, it's swinging. We're talking about reckon, you know, creating a new government, National Assembly. Louis XIV, they force him to dress up like one of the revolutionaries, and they put on the little the hat of the French Revolution. Um, uh, but then this guy comes in. This is Robespierre. This is now a reaction to what it was before, and that's what pendulums are, a reaction to what it was like before. His fear, and he breeds this fear in everybody within France, that they may that we, we may install a monarchy again. So we need to be able to stop everything. So thus begins this period called the Reign of Terror, in which that the guillotine is run by and ruled by the masses, the mob. And you can look at this. They are literally drunk with power and vengeance. And they're destroying not here, not even a, they are symbols, but we know the clergy 
their aristocracy, they're destroying them. And so begins this period where even Louis, Louis is going to be forced to uh, give up his own life. And what's interesting is when he stands up, uh, up with the guillotine, he's given his last words, and Louis ultimately doesn't even blame the French people. He, he blames the, the fervor, the, how everything got out of control. And then a few days later, Jacques-Louis David is there when he, he watches uh, Marie Antoinette, Louis' wife, who was hated by the people. And he grabs his sketch pad, and all he has is a pencil with him, and he quickly sketches out Marie Antoinette, who was blamed for so many of France's problems. She overspent. She had ridiculous hairstyles. These hairstyles of the day would be so large. Sometimes they had actually put cages and live birds inside their hair. Um, uh, the amount of money she spent on palaces, and here she is right before her death, and all she is in is a simple gown and a cap, and Jacques-Louis David is, um, and uh, sketches it out. And her last words were very, um, uh, yeah. yeah, and so very reserved, still, still sort of a queen to the end. Uh, the people, of course, were very happy to see her go. Um, Somebody asked in uh, the other classes about that whole comment about let them eat cake, and I had a picture of a, car a cartoon on it. Uh, the whole phrase let them eat cake is interesting because w w early in the, 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 uh, before the revolution began, when the uh, French people, when the advisors come in and say that the French people don't have enough bread to eat, and then Maria interjects and says, well, if they don't have bread, let them eat cake. Okay. And then they would have to, then the follow-up was, well, it's not about cake. They don't have enough food to eat. Hold on one second. So ultimately, yeah, they don't let them eat pie. Um, so she uh, show, shows this huge disconnect that doesn't even understand her own people, that they're starving, and understand what life is like for the, for the, uh, for the people of France. The sad part is that she did not say let them eat pie, you know, but is the fact that she never said it at all. Yes, she did not make this statement. Every historian will agree the fact that this was done by the French people. Another monarch in the past had said it, and then they had just sort of created this urban myth that Marie Antoinette had said it, and it spread like wildfire, and it just went to this hatred that they all had for her. And the cartoon on the website was, and ice cream. I said, I let them eat cake and ice cream. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. And he was like, the calmer cutting his hair. So as the blade came down, he was like, missed the line, and it went into his neck jaw. And then so the uh, dude had to get up on top with his assistant and press down on it. Oh. 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 Was he alive? Was he alive? Speaking of alive, now what happens to him? He creates this, this, this passion for this, this reign of terror. Then ultimately... Um, People realized, everybody who spoke out and said, maybe Robespierre's gone a little crazy with power, sent to the guillotine, sent to the guillotine without any real trial. And all this is going to lead towards problems with the legal system. You just can't send people off to be, to be assassinated, to be killed, right? And so ultimately, as enough of them rally up and they say, let's go get Robespierre. They march into his office. He had sensed things were happening. He sees them coming in. He grabs a gun, puts it in his mouth, shoots, turns at the last second, and he shoots his entire jaw. His cheek and all that is all off. And he's alive, and they quickly grab him, and, they, and they, they wrap up his mouth. And so he's bleeding over the next several days. They put him in prison, and they, and they quickly expedite a trial for him, and he is sent to the guillotine, and where they can kill him on purpose. Is he the enemy of the people now? Enemy of the people? Like you're an enemy of the people. Yes, the yes. So he is the archetype, uh, archetype behind the whole thing. He was very venomous with his words and everything revolutionary. The only person who had more venom in his words was the video that you saw, Jean-Paul Marat, in terms of the things that he wrote. And why was he assassinated? Is because, you know, the assassin felt that he was somebody who was way to the extreme, and his words were so inflammatory, creating this situation. Then, ultimately, this needs to come back to some sense of stability. Well, an interesting story is France at the time is dealing with all of this, internal revolutions and, and, and reigns of terror and all this. But guess what? Everybody throughout France, if you're Prussia and Austria, guess what you would be worried about? And you saw it in the Amadeus video. I'm worried that people in my country may be inspired by what they're doing and now going to want to overthrow me. That's what's happening in the Arab world today. What happened in one place, okay, 
is spreading all over the place. Tunisia and Egypt and Libya and, oh my goodness, Syria. It's happening everywhere because it happened one place. So what's a way to stop that? Let's all attack France. So now they got to deal with uh, others attacking him. Well, a young lieutenant who's actually technically not French. He's not from France. He's from a French uh, uh, province of an island known as Corsica. And so this young lieutenant, um, who is a military genius, particularly in terms of with artillery and cannon, he, his name is Napoleon. You've heard of him before. And so he had one, and there's one famous battle. He helped save, this, he helped save Paris. So he becomes a, uh, a hero to the people, and he slowly rises or quickly rises through the ranks of um, getting into government. And we don't need to deal with the whole, pro, uh, the whole details about how he gets there, but he ultimately is going to get more and more power by himself. And when he starts to take over, he does a couple interesting things. He wants to save France and make France what the revolution stood for. But he wants to make it stable because it's not stable. First, one of the things he does is he comes, comes up with a thing called the Concordant of 1801. Big fancy word. Basically says, we've overthrown the church and said the church is wrong and wicked. We need to bring the church back. So he creates a union between the government and the Catholic Church, redefining the church's role. No longer do they have the, the power that they did before. And so you see things like education now being in the hands of the government, not in hands of the, uh, the church. So this is an agreement to help reconcile the issues with the Catholic Church. Yes? Is that why there's a church at Saint Bonaparte? I don't think so. On this, particular, this is the, uh, image, or an early image of Napoleon I found. Then the second thing he's going to come up with is he looked at the reign of terror and said that of all the we've had a lot of problems, particularly with how fast people are being sentenced. And this is not against any sort of this is against all sort of ideas of what is legal. And so we think about we go back to Hammurabi's law code, the Roman Republic, their law, Justinian's law code. The next big step here is the Napoleonic code. And the Napoleonic code promises the things if if our base uh the beginning of our legal system with today comes from the romans and, and, and the byzantines our modern system is right out of napoleon's book hey you you, you get the police pick you up guess what's going to happen then it's not going to send you away you got a right to a trial you get a right to defend yourself a right to speak out against your accuser a right to this and a right to that much of that comes from the napoleon's code he thought this was pretty special how special did he think it was well, first off, he knows, look at it, it starts to spread to all these different countries. The Napoleonic Code is going to be embraced by many people. Napoleon ultimately says this about his code. My glory is not to have won 40 battles, for Waterloo's defeat will destroy the memory of his many victories. But what nothing will destroy, what will live eternally, will be my civil code. He said everything I've done and everything that I stand for is nothing. Did he think this was special in himself was? Yeah. Look at that. That's straight out of like Sistine Chapel. That's him up there, up there and in the heavens. And what, what is he doing? He's not painting. He himself yes, he photoshopped himself into the Sistine Chapel or whatever. But he's, what does he have there? His civil code. Okay, this is what he held. Because what did he see? In essence, he saw himself as a defender of the French Revolution, of the people. Problem, though. He got out of control. He's worried about France, and then he realized, I need to... He starts to turn on the offensive. Well, I'll go after Prussia, which is Germany, and Austria, and Britain, his arch enemy. But meanwhile, he's suffering. There's a, there's a revolution in Haiti happening. He gives up on Haiti. He could have gotten Haiti back. Forget Haiti. We also got some possession in America. I'm going to sell it. I don't need that because I'm focusing on Europe. From our perspective, we're shocked at the idea that we got half of the entire United States for $15 million. Thomas Jefferson buys it. And by the way, didn't ask Congress. Broke the law. Jefferson was offered the deal, once in a lifetime deal. Napoleon says, do you want this Louisiana purchase? And Jefferson says, I need to check with Congress. And Napoleon says, time's ticking. He goes, fine, I'll take it. And we always, people go, Napoleon, I cannot believe he sold it. Well, he didn't want it. So he, he got himself money in it, it, when France was cash strapped, and he focuses himself on Europe. He invades Spain. Spain is very far behind. Like we said, we're not hearing about Spain anymore. And this famous image, which we see a, a, a change from the Enlightenment to a new period called Romanticism. And Romanticism is interesting because this has not about the heady intellectual, but about passion. And here are Napoleonic soldiers invading Spain and killing a bunch of Spaniards 
even including a friar and people who are there declaring innocence, the Spanish will fight back, and the way they fight back is going to change war and define the world in which that we live in today. Because they come up with a new way of fighting, based off the Spanish word for war, which is what? Yes, guerre, and they come up with a word called guerrilla. Guerrilla style fighting, which is what we talk about today in terms of we're never going to engage another nation in a gigantic land army versus army. We're fighting against people who hit and run away, which the Spanish do against the Napoleonic soldiers. Question. Um, this is a really weird question. How big is it compared to like actual like, like the amount of land that mm, two, maybe twice, twice, two or three times the size? Oh. Yeah. So now here's Napoleon. This is the problem that Napoleon did though, is that he wanted to save the French Revolution and who does he look like, people? He looks like Caesar. He's got the Caesar laurels. He looks like an emperor. Okay. He, he transforms himself from a defender. And your friends in regular world history, what they do when they learn about the French Revolution, their final question, their subject, their culminating thing, is they come up with an idea. They have to answer the prompt of, did Napoleon save or destroy the, French, the ideas of the French Revolution? And there's answers to both. He saved it. The Napoleonic Code. He destroyed it. He be, they, they killed a king and they got an emperor instead. Okay. So lots of things that Napoleon ultimately will do. This is him actually crowning himself. He doesn't even want anybody else to crown him. He goes into Notre Dame. He grabs the, co the crown, puts it on himself. And ultimately, like, we, like I just mentioned, the idea of liberty and what Napoleon does. If King Louis XVI extinguishes the flame of liberty, destroys it, the French Revolution, there's that hat, okay? And who is this? Is this a particular person? Uh-uh. Right? Who is this? A lady. And what does a lady often represent? We got one in New York. Liberty. Okay. Liberty will light the flame. Okay? And there it is here. She is liberty. She is lighting. Hold on a second. And then lastly, 5-2 Napoleon comes along and does what? And blows it out. There's our Statue of Liberty, yes. Which, by the way, came from who? France. Thank you very much, everybody. I wish we could do more on Napoleon. We'll see you next time. Chapter 19, do. See ya. Uh-huh. Sure, yeah. I'll just print one then.